This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Dr. Urbar Khan is Runnymede's acting director, the acting director of the Runnymede Trust, Britain's think tank for anti-racism. Prior to this, he was Runnymede's head of policy and he led the financial inclusion program. Omar sits on the Department for Work and Pensions Ethnic Minority Advisory Group. He is also a 2012 CLAW Social Leadership Fellow. Omar's other advisory positions include Chair of Olmec, a social enterprise, the 2001 Census, the Household Longitudinal <coughs> Survey, the Electoral Reform Society, the Payments Council, and the UK representative on the European Commission's Social Economic Network of Experts. Omar completed a DPhil in political theory from the University of Oxford, a master's in political science from the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and a master's in South Asian studies from the School of Oriental and African Studies. Omar has published many articles and reports on political theory and British political history for Runnymede over the past eight years, and has spoken on topics including multiculturalism, integration, socioeconomic disadvantage, and positive action. These include giving evidence to the United Nations in Geneva, the European Parliament in Strasbourg, on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., academic conferences in Manchester, Oxford, Paris, Warsaw, the CRE Race Convention, the Lithuanian Centre for Human Rights, a Treasury DFID Conference on Remittances, and St. George's House. Windsor Castle, Wilton Park, and many other engagements in the UK. I give you Dr. Omar Khan. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Nathaniel, and thank you for organizing this really important event and inviting me here to speak. Um, in many ways, the advertised title of my speech, as you might have gathered, is misleading. Um, in the first instance, and as you've undoubtedly already gathered from hearing me speak, I was born in the US. And that, of course, somewhat influences my views about race. However, my professional and intellectual thinking on race has been grounded in my experience of studying and living here since 1996, doing my doctorate at Oxford, and working at Runnymede, the UK's uh, race equality think tank, although uh, Andy from Rhoda is also here, another, uh, I think, uh, organization working in this space. Uh, and I've been working there for uh, around a decade. Second is that I will speak somewhat less about philosophy proper and more about the intersection of philosophy and policy or rather, what philosophy can do to contribute to policy making and policy thinking. Third, my philosophical training is perhaps unsurprisingly less of the critical school and more of the dominant Anglo-American liberal school. And when I say this is unsurprising, it's simply because I completed my doctorate at Oxford, which is the dominant way of thinking. Um, but I did com complete that uh, do uh, doctorate over five years ago now. Fourth and lastly, my position as director of this running meet is perhaps as much based on my experience in sociology and policy engagement, as you hear from my relatively large number of advisory roles, as in philosophy, which is a discipline in which I have had rather little practice since my doctoral defense those five years ago. So an apology and an excuse, I suppose, there. Um, but in this talk, I want to address two issues. Uh, Nathaniel has already highlighted, which is that the first, uh, my topic of my doctoral dissertation was the moral justifiability of affirmative action, or preferential policies, or positive action whatever you want to call them, a topic that I actually apply to the case of India. I'm not going to talk so much about the case of India, I'm going to talk more about how I feel those justifications apply to uh, the UK and Europe. Second, I want to suggest the way in which philosophy or perhaps philosophical methods or thinking can and might do more to address policy outcomes. I hope these two somewhat different questions come together in my talk, but I hope there's time afterwards if you feel the intersection is still obscure. Let me start with the second point first, as I will address it more briefly. Philosophy is as much a way of thinking and doing as it is an academic discipline. I do not actually apply my philosophical knowledge or learning regularly in my day job, but I do use the tools I learned through studying philosophy, namely rigorous argument and spotting sloppy argument and inconsistencies in interacting with policymakers. I can say more about that um, in the questions if you want, but there are plenty of cases where government consultation documents are riddled with internal errors and inconsistencies, and it can be very useful to have an analytical mind in addressing them. 
However, there are two important caveats, I think, to this overall positive contribution. I believe philosophy can and should be making more uh, to policy making. And I hope many of you in the room who are studying philosophy don't do consider um, a career in philosophy because we need more black and Asian philosophers in Britain. But we also need more people with philosophical training influencing policy. Um, and I'm going to focus, of course, on race equality policy. First is that we must concede, I think, that philosophical arguments don't always or straightforwardly yield direct policy prescriptions. So two philosophers may share the same view, but they may legitimately differ regarding the, the policies in the real world that instantiate that view. Or, conversely, two philosophers may otherwise be in disagreement, but might support a particular policy for somewhat discrepant reasons. Second is that while, however well crafted a philosophical position, it is vulnerable to real world challenges that undermine the assumptions driving that position. I will not go into this in great detail, but one re reason that affirmative action is less popular than it otherwise might be in the United States, and that is becoming somewhat less popular than it used to be, is because the so called losers of the policy do not appear particularly advantaged. That is, rich white men do not seem to be disadvantaged by affirmative action, and it is rather those who apply for jobs like firemen. So it doesn't appear that those who are the greatest, uh, sort of most responsible, or most benefit from racial injustice are those who are the, uh, pay for or are the losers of the policy. Conversely, many of the quote-unquote beneficiaries of the policy appear better off as graduates from Harvard Law School inevitably are. I want to make a brief point here because I think it's, I don't want to be mis, uh, I, th I think it's worth making in terms of the claim I made about moral responsibility. Uh, to, to say that people uh, ought to do something in response to uh, historical or current injustice is not to say that they must be morally responsible for that injustice. We merely need to say that they benefit from that injustice. If you as a person have a job, in part because a whole class of people are denied opportunities in that society, even if you yourself were not morally responsible for creating slavery or any other inequalities, and this includes new migrants to countries like myself to the United States, I benefited in the United States from the fact that historically there was injustice against African Americans. Was my family morally responsible? We can have an argument about that. They were migrants not from the United States. But I don't feel we need to get that argument off the ground. We can, we can uh, push a weaker but still important claim, which is that white people benefit from a system of injustice, whether or not they are morally responsible for it, which is a more controversial claim. Parking that. Um, um, in Britain, when I argue for positive affirmative action, I think it's sometimes misheard, partly because of my accent, and they assume that I'm talking about the American case, and they assume it's based on compensatory justice for the wrong of slavery. It has proven almost impossible to convince these dissenters of the basic fact that the U.S. Supreme Court rejected a compensatory defense of affirmative action. But perhaps, so there's something to say about that. Why is affirmative action pushed in the U.S.? But I, I think more importantly is to get an audience here and elsewhere, perhaps here is actually a more <laughs> open audience to this argument, to listen effectively to an argument that current injustice, whatever the difficulties of constructing a compensatory historical claim for affirmative action, that current injustice demands a policy response, even if those dissenters deem affirmative action too radical solution. So turning then to affirmative action, as a prelude, I should note that I fully realize, just in case you're, you want to press this point, or in case a, uh, a, a lawyer uh, suggests otherwise, that affirmative action as I'm arguing for, is not legal, except in the narrowest sense in Britain and Europe. So there's obviously some campaigning work to be done to change that. However, it's worth reflecting on how we might justify affirmative action, even if it is unlikely to be achieved as a policy anytime soon. In so doing, we can also learn more about how to justify policy on race and in responding to race inequalities more generally, but also the challenges of doing so, some of which may particularly interest uh, critical uh, scholars of race. Arguments for preferential policies, I would say, should not be viewed as controversial, at least if we understand better what those policies are arguing for. Common objections, as I said, are useful for indicating where we need to focus our energies. Notably, opponents argue, among other things, that the beneficiaries of affirmative action are a rather advantaged group, and therefore the policy is somehow unjustifiable. At first, this argument may seem somewhat plausible. 
After all, even Barack Obama has suggested that his own daughters ought not to benefit from affirmative action, given their otherwise advantaged position. I don't have time here to get more into the question of who loses from the application of affirmative action, which is controversial, but I think there is more to say about it. Instead, I want to highlight quite briefly what this objection gets wrong. Preferential policies, or affirmative action, is not applied to benefit a particular individual. Preferential policies are rather applied to respond to injustice that affects a wider group. This is responding to a group-based harm, and of course, this is typically a racialized minority. It, just, it shows just how far our public debate has moved backwards. The people have forgotten that the application of affirmative action was developed as a response to a group-based harm, namely racial or ethnic discrimination. The intent of the policy then was to prevent all such members of the group, all such members of the group, not just the individual beneficiary, from continuing to suffer from the consequences of racism. Now, we need a story for how that is the case, and I, I don't have as much time as I'd like to, to build on that story. But I think one of the things we need to attend to a bit more carefully is two particular questions when thinking about the justifiability of preferential policies, or indeed any policy. First, who benefits? And second, what benefits do they get? As I've argued, too much of the discussion and the objection is about the narrow question of those individuals who get a job or a position in a university or by an employer, and not enough about the wider, case, uh, the wider set of beneficiaries, and therefore <coughs> the benefits that people get have focused too much on the, job, on the wider effects the preferential policies can have on people's attitudes, on our opportunity structures, and on networks. This may seem obvious, but as I've said, a lot of the focus has been on this narrow group of ben uh, beneficiaries. The actual benefits and beneficiaries are indeed much wider. I would distinguish three sets of beneficiaries. Those direct beneficiaries, we can't deny that they get benefits by getting jobs. Those are those who actually get a job or position. The second set of beneficiaries are all members of the group or the beneficiary class or group. In this case, we are talking about racialized minorities, every black or Asian person in Britain, or however, whatever other groups have been uh, uh, disadvantaged by group-based harms in that way that are, that are based on racial injustice. There is a third set of beneficiaries that I think we heard earlier from Annabelle Lieber's uh, 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 presentation, which is that we all benefit, and I hinted at it as well in my comments. Um, in my dissertation, I do build on that epistemic claim that for, eco for democratic equality to be a, a sort of, uh, to be real, we, uh, people need to, we need to live in a society where there are less racial inequalities. And one of the problems is that in a world with racial inequalities, which of course is every country in, in the world that exists that we know of, um, uh, people don't always know what it's like to be a member of a different group. And this is a claim about um, epistemology that we can get into. But let me just, in addition to the case of Carol Mosley Brown, which I feel shows the sort of empirical plausibility of that philosophical claim, think about in the UK. There was only one black Caribbean student admitted to Oxford one year. How far do we believe that our political leaders really understand the needs and interests of black Caribbean people in this country when they have so little interaction with them and they don't hear their needs and voices? How far do we really feel that they understand what it's like to be in that position and how far then do they respond to their needs? Um, similarly, that such leaders are more likely to spot the moral evil of racism in Diane Abbott's otherwise innocuous tweets than in their own institutions continuing discriminatory uh, practices. Um, so there are these wider effects. I'm happy to talk about them later. But as I've argued already, my, my argument is that the rights and wrongs focus too much on the person who gets a job and, 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 or a position. Morally and indeed practically in terms of the application and the more relevant set of beneficiaries are all of those people who have experienced injustice. There are two reasons why the objection that focuses on direct beneficiaries has gained such traction. First is a non-philosophical but obviously false reason, naming the increasingly widespread view that we live in a post-racial society. I'm just going to state that that's false. <laughs> if you want to argue, we can have an argue about statistics afterwards. More significantly is that defenders of affirmative action haven't defined precisely enough that second question I mentioned above, namely, what benefits does affirmative action bring? It seems obvious. But in my dissertation, I argued for four different kinds of benefit, namely compensatory justice, current or distributive justice, democratic equality, and community or group-based arguments. I don't have time to go into all of those, and I, I would build on Annabelle, I built on arguments like those of Annabelle Lever around democratic inequality. 
And I obviously also don't have time to go into the Indian case. But I think the applicability of compensatory arguments to the British and European cases are more controversial, and I will therefore sidestep those arguments, though I agree with Nathaniel that there is an important debate to be had about reparations. And for those who are interested, there's a further kind of interesting piece recently uh, written by ta -Nahisi Coates in The Atlantic that I think gets into this in some detail. Um, I'm going to focus instead more directly on current injustice and the place of group-based claims more generally in philosophy. As an aside, here I want to reflect on the inability of policymakers to wrap their heads around the notion that policy could target people on grounds of race or ethnicity. I don't want to understand the difficulty of simply assuming the social significance of race, but like Nathaniel, the my, my focus is that the reality is social outcomes in Britain, and indeed throughout Europe, show worse outcomes on the basis of being racial, a racialized minority. So while policymakers have no difficulty in apprehending the notion that low-income groups have particular needs, or that commuters perhaps have needs that means that you need to build roads or trains in particular areas, they seem less able to understand that policies targeting ethnic minorities are responding to a real need, namely the social inequalities that result from discrimination. So I think it is important to get these arguments on the table so that we can also combat that widespread view that somehow policies that respond to class or other inequalities are justifiable, whereas those that respond to racial inequalities are clearly uh, unjustifiable. So returning now to arguments of affirmative action, particularly for those racialized as black, whatever the historic reasons and legacies for that injustice, states ought to respond to this group-based harm, whether or not they think that affirmative actions are, just, are, are the best solution. The failure to respond to these injustices represents a failure of equal liberty and of democracy. Affirmative action is meant to benefit every member of a group, and this is justified because the injustice in question is a group-based wrong that picks out people for unjust treatment on grounds of race, or perhaps more accurately on racialized grounds. But the more important point is that all members of the group are so harmed, and so thereby are legitimate beneficiaries of policies to make state or society more just. On these arguments, the key point is that every member benefits. Given the history of affirmative action as a response to structural and historic racism, this should be obvious. But let me spell out more clearly. What specifically would happen? What are the benefits that flow to a black person if another black person becomes a high court judge in Britain? The argument has to be that this benefits every black person in Britain. And how could this then be so? There are various ways to make this argument, including more equal opportunities, access to social networks, and breaking down the stereotypes, the sort of arguments as well around respect and dignity. Um, I want to focus on a particular Rawlsian argument here uh, because it reveals both the strength of and the potential weakness of mainstream analytical philosophy to address this question. In theory of justice, Rawls argues that in order for the value of equal liberties to be experienced by everyone, we each require the social bases of self-respect. He further elaborated that the social bases of self-respect were met when at least one set of people affirmed the value of the projects or ends that we choose to pursue in our own lives. That is that one group of people in society uh, agrees with the pro that the projects that we identify, the values that we affirm, are indeed valuable. We need at least one such group in order to have what he calls the social basis of self-respect. And I think it is an important uh, concession by Rawls to non-individual claims about the necessity of, of groups and interactions with others uh, in society. So perhaps less individuals than you might think, and so far, so good. But yet, what about a person whose social group respects and affirms their self-identity? and their choice of projects and values, but where that group is subject to discrimination and public hatred. Is it really enough for only one group in society to value the identity I affirm and the projects I pursue for me to experience the social bases of self-respect and so to affirm my equal liberties? That's where affirmative action seeks to intervene, by ensuring that members of groups who have been discriminated against in the past are represented or degraded in the past are represented in important political, social, and economic institutions they better ensure that every member of those groups can experience what Rawls calls the social bases of self-respect. And so the equal liberties that are, or perhaps rather should be, the hallmark of a just democratic society. This example suggests, I think, that political philosophy, and philosophy generally, may operate too comfortably at the level of ideal theory. I would suggest that most theories of justice, including most in the Rawlsian tradition, of course, simply assume that racism is unjust. They don't turn their analytical eye on the wrongness of things that are obviously bad. They view their task rather as constructing an ideal theory of justice and have less interest in responding to the messy business of real world injustices, injustices that maybe they view as clearly driven by irrationality and fear. This, however, is not good enough, and it simply isn't true that political philosophers only operate at the terrain of ideal theory. 
and pay no attention to real-world considerations or constraints. The most obvious case is that of nationality, on which there is a very uh, robust uh, philosophical literature. Political philosophers have spent a great deal of energy focusing on the moral justifiability of nationality, including such questions as legitimate partiality and our duties of gratitude towards those who have benefited us. I don't have time to unpick this literature, but I raise it here uh, because it actually addresses the wider question of the moral status of groups or group belonging, or the obligations to people who share a similar experience to ourselves, even if nationalists typically only address the moral nature of our relationship with co-nationals. According to nationalists, the value of nationality is so strong as to concede the monopoly of violence to the nation state, to allow the saving of a drowning co-national over a foreigner, and to discount the seemingly more urgent claims of the starving poor in other nations. But if the claim is that we have duties towards those who benefit us, it's obvious enough that there are many such groups who benefit us other than our nation, both more internationally and more locally. Addressing the question of this conference, many racialized minorities benefit particularly from other members of their group for crafting their sense of self, for interacting meaningfully in social and indeed sexual relationships, for providing resources and emotional support for learning how to respond to racism in a less personally destructive way, and indeed in getting a loan, a job, or advice about how to progress in the labor market. These are no small benefits. And the obvious implication is that racialized groups can owe duties of gratitude towards one another in societies still affected by racism, which again is to say, all societies currently on Earth. Let us concede, for the sake of argument, because I don't have time to argue this point, that the duties are somehow less than we owe to our co-nationalists. That is, our duties to our co-ethnics are less than the duties we owe to our co-nationalists. Even if our co-nationalists are members of the English Defense League, admirers of empire, deniers of the effects of colonialism, like so many of our political leaders. It obviously doesn't follow that however strong my moral duty to save the life of Nigel Farage over that of a hapless Eritrean, that we have no duties of gratitude towards those who experience the same sort of racialization as ourselves, and who support us directly and indirectly in navigating racism in the world. This then looks like an argument for preferential policies. If our ties to co-nationalists can justify all the rights and powers of the nation state, and such a strong form of moral partiality, surely our ties to those who support us in addressing racism both justify and explain why we might all benefit from preferential policies. To forestall misinterpretation, I'm not saying that ethnic or racialized minorities do have a strong moral claim to any particular policies or rights deriving from the duties of gratitude they may or may not owe one another. That we, they, we may not all share that experience. And in any case, I would argue that the current injustice of racism is sufficient to justify policies to respond to that injustice. What I am saying is the conventional nationalist position is based on affirming extraordinarily strong claims about what membership in a particular group, the nation, can justify, both in terms of our moral partiality towards co-nationals and in terms of resisting the claims of the poor in other nations whose needs might otherwise be plausibly viewed as more urgent. What I am saying is that the conventional nationalist position is therefore built on a claim about the moral value of group belonging and that the duties of gratitude that flow from such belonging and so they cannot coherently object to group-based arguments for weaker policies, far weaker policies, a few positions in our political institutions. The nationalists defend amongst groups who have experienced injustice and exploitation over centuries. In general, I would rather, to, I'm concluding now, um, so in general I'd rather view these group-based claims, affirmative action or otherwise, as better grounded in terms of responding to injustice. I had that somewhat long uh, digression into nationality and group-based claims there because I wanted to show what we can, um, that when pushed, I think a lot of political philosophers might say that they don't look at, that they just assume away the wrong of racism and that there isn't sort of a philosophical question here because it's so obviously wrong, but they do address quite a lot this question of the moral status of the nation, and I don't think they've done so in a very coherent way in terms of starting, rather from starting from the question, how morally might we legitimate nationality, rather they should start from the question of what are the principles uh, underpinning the notion that we owe duties or uh, moral partiality to members of a different group? And what then is the nature of that group that would justify partiality? And where would the nature of that group belonging not justify moral partiality? Because I think all of us ought to concede that group-based belonging does not always justify moral partiality. So rather than ex ex echoing some of the morally extraordinarily claims about how far group belonging can justify partiality towards in-group members, 
which instead emphasize that policies ought to respond to continuing injustice. Racism is a group-based harm that affects every member of the racialized group. Clarence Thomas, the US Supreme Court judge who does not like affirmative action even though he was a beneficiary of it, will not be picked up by a racist white taxi driver regardless of the fact that he does not identify as African-American or with African-American politics. Every member of that group, regardless of their own individual values or uh, political views, is harmed by that kind of racist behavior. So racism is a group-based harm. Focusing on justice rather than moralizing and affirming the continuing salience of a particular group identity is not only more likely to succeed, given its resonance with mainstream views about philosophy and politics and policy, but it also resonates with more critical views about the meaning of race and better responds to the continuing racial inequalities experienced by ethnic minorities in Britain and indeed the world. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Carr. Oh, Mars, it's fine. <laughs> Thank you. So, we have half an hour now, before the end of our conference. Thank you for participating in this. This is your opportunity to raise any ideas, any questions, comments that may have risen in your mind during the last day and a half, with particular reference to how do we move forward? What do we want the critical philosophy of race to do for us in this country? <clears throat> One particular way in which the critical philosophy of race could do something for us here in Britain is if we take Omar's uh, argument and run with it, um, explore it, um, positive, affirmative action. So this might be one of the ways in which you want to comment upon critical philosophy of race here in the future. The floor is open. Gosh. <laughs> <laughs> and I shall try to include people who haven't spoken uh, yet. But no, please raise your hands. Uh, uh, indeed, and, uh, and uh, um, I guess, uh, Dante. So my name's Catherine, I'm a PhD student in philosophy at Sheffield University and I want to thank um, you know, all of the speakers and everybody at this conference, it's been an amazing event and the, the main thing that I feel, well one of the things that I think we could really do going forward is just to get critical philosophy of race on the undergraduate philosophy curriculum, make a really concerted effort to do that and I know that might seem very limited and, and you know, there you know, might be more exciting and broader ways and we should look at those too but I feel that and um, there is a, a not particularly political argument to be made for getting it on the syllabus, which is that without it, our teaching is pedagogically unsound, it's partial, it's limited, and it's less philosophically robust. Um, and I think that that argument should come out very clearly and concertedly, and including um, one thing we could do is to create resources that we could share for really pushing this in a very immediate way, change our teaching practices. Sure. Hi, um, I really like the fact that your talk actually, I just wanted to interrogate a bit the assumptions about affirmative action and I agree that this is a very interesting area, not in terms of whether or not it's legally permissible, but whether it's morally worthy, shall we say. Um, firstly, I think you understated the negative impact, potentially, of recruiting, selecting somebody at a job interview, for example, um, both in fact and the appearance of because of their race leaving aside whether or not they self-identify with that race and therefore are a victim of a group harm. The, the long-term consequence of that could be, for example, that they, are, they receive diminished <coughs> respect in the workforce because they're perceived to have received this unfair advantage. Also, I'm not sure I agree with your statement about those who may have got the job otherwise. Let's say they were better. That breaks against our sensibilities about meritocracy. So I think the real worry here is that we've got two different forms, well, many different forms of equality. One of them is equality of opportunity, which is one, one of the best ways, potentially, of railing against group-based harms, against you know, racialized minorities. So there's an internal problem there that with this positive discrimination policy, which is looking at 
show, well, I call it positive discrimination, but which is looking at the outcome, quality of outcome, in terms of group representation. Is, should that trump this worry about you know, equality of opportunity? And I think you haven't really addressed that. Yeah. Um, moreover, I think there's uh, an asymmetry. I liked your closing example about somebody potentially doesn't identify with the group and is saying, well, look, I'm not, uh, what do we say to that person? I think we say something different in the case of him being the target of racial discrimination. In the same way that I would criticize somebody who said, look, in the United Kingdom, I don't mind being stopped and searched disproportionately. I would criticize that person because I would say that, yeah, they are potentially the victim of a, an oppressive regime there. And the fact that they're voluntarily assenting to it is actually damaging the chances of those people who are you know, less accommodating, but belong to their group, damaging their chances of actually addressing that injustice, which is a real injustice, whether or not they realize it. But I think there's an asymmetry there um, to one in which somebody chooses not to self-identify with the group and says, for example, I don't want to be the benefactor of this uh, positive discrimination policy. And I think they're quite entitled to say that. And moreover, because there may be a long-term benefit which you are frustrating from then being seen to get to those positions within society by the longer route, or maybe because they have to be better than they would have had to be otherwise. And the third question, we should probably take a few more. If you, yeah, I've got that. Uh, I want to get as many people uh, involved in the discussion as possible. Uh, uh, so I'm going to get Dante Michaud. I'm a PhD candidate at UCL in English Language and Literature. Um, Mine was not so much a question as a comment. Um, I'm currently in a, in a via Twitter discussion with the noted activist Lee Jasper, who earlier this morning asked the question, when will British academics uh, leave their ivory towers, get active on the front line of the fight against racism? And I think one of the ways... Hashtag it, Yes, hashtag <laughs> <real risk>. um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I think one of the, one of the ways in which this, is, this conference has been helpful is for us to see, certainly with um, the contributions of activists in, in the talks uh, that were presented, that academics, black academics in particular, are already on the front lines. And I think um, the critical philosophy of race can, can do some work in helping to define what that front line is, how broad that front line is. That front line doesn't only mean you know, uh, being in the latest march against some EDL uh, comment or, or member it is providing an intellectual and, um, and also activist context for, for anti-racist work. So, yes. um, Justin, uh, Judith, and Zara. Uh, 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 yeah, this is just summarizing some of my thoughts in, uh, from the past two days rather than adding anything new, but I think one of the most promising developments here going forward with the event you're organizing next year is the dislodging of the American domination of critical philosophy of race and the, the arrival at something closer to a properly global perspective that takes into uh, consideration um, distinct uh, regional and uh, national histories and the way these affect the way people uh, understand the concept of race in different places and the way people are racialized differently in different places. Uh, two uh, comments about the French context to, 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 to emphasize this. Recently there was a volume uh, uh, translated and edited by Megali Bessone uh, uh, bringing together a number of recent uh, scholars of uh, more or less analytic philosophy of race uh, from the United States in a volume in French. And I was invited to comment on this, and almost all of it was perfectly irrelevant to the sort of questions that need to be talked about there. Not perfectly irrelevant, but it's certainly far from a perfect fit. And one thing I think that, that, that is distinctive here in, in, in all European countries is the way the question of immigration uh, gets talked about in racialized ways that is not necessarily the case in the United States. So it's very important to, um, to, to de-Americanize the discussion. And I think that's what, what, is, what, is, what is beginning to be done here. Um, 
Institute of Food and Institute of Education. I just want to go back to uh, Catherine's point about the curriculum. I agree with that, but I think that opens more questions than it resolves. Because the question is then where, where does that leave our choices about the curriculum? And there's, there's several directions one could go. Yeah, I think this is a conversation that would be very useful to have with other philosophers. I completely take the point about activism, but I am also uh, an academic in, in a philosophy I teach philosophy, and there are choices about the curriculum. Now, one view one could take is to quote Audre Lorde, that the master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. And it seems to me what was interesting about Omar's presentation was that you were using the tools of analytic philosophy and the resources of liberal theory to make an argument about the critical philosophy of race that has very clear political implications. That's one way one could go, but one could also take the position that actually these are the wrong tools to be using. The tools are discredited, that the house has to be demolished in some other way and started from scratch. And then other, I think, you know, that's a well-respected view too. And we could perhaps learn from the kind of debates that went on within um, the women's movement around the different approaches one can take to changing the curriculum, to changing what people are taught. And I think that would be a good conversation to have. And so, one is to think an extension of both of these points that uh, just came up. First, I'll just start with a question, actually. I, I just, I wasn't quite clear on whether you were, you seem to be saying that the, the analytic philosophy, I agree with what you're saying, that you know, ideal theory tends to be ascendant. Um, you seem to indicate that the debates on nationalism were a kind of little area when an ideal theory was being done, and I just wanted to say a bit more about that. Sort of way. I now was going to make a comment on the um, pedagogical question, um, which is, um, I should introduce myself, I'm Zara Bay, and I'm simply starting with PhD in philosophy. I'm also involved with the A level of philosophy in this country, and I've been teaching philosophy for a while, so this is kind of, I'll talk about the first year undergraduate stuff. There's lots of transition issues between, you know, actually sending people off to university to do philosophy, and then dealing with them when you get there at the institutional level. Um, I think the idea of actually putting critical philosophy for you know, in syllabi is a really interesting one, but I think that there's another question around you know, I'd say this because of you know, a disabled person as well, and people often go, oh, go and do disability studies. And you think, well, why do we always have this pocketing where feminism gets taught in feminism courses, and critical philosophy of race gets taught in critical philosophy of race courses, and disability theory gets taught in disability theory courses. And actually, quite frankly, you know, having found Charles Mills recently, who just kind of blew my world open, you think, no, 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 actually, when I teach a social contract, I need to be teaching Mills. Just as I, if I'm teaching anything to do with international relations, Fanon actually should be stuck at the start of the course rather than the end of the course to open up sorts of questions about, well, actually, how we're doing this. So I think even if we were to conceive that there need to be dedicated courses for, for, for more advanced students, I think there's a really important question about how we engage introductions to philosophy in multiple ways, both to ensure that the people who are doing philosophy, which let's face it, are a majority of white guys, usually, how do we start to open, how do we change that demographic, first question? How do we start to create a different sort of introductory philosophy class where it's actually a lot more diverse? And I know there's data that said, I think last year there was a study that, that looked at uh, reading this in philosophy courses in the state, which found that the rates of attrition predominantly for women for people from ethnic minorities, people of colour, were much, much higher, and the major reason cited was the absence of any belief that generally old white dudes on course reading lists. This is data that exists in the world running the philosophy um, You know, we, I think I agree with Judith, we have to start having a conversation. So I think I would be really interested, you know, if we can continue, we'd be, you know, if we could have a conference on that, that would be great. How do we de white old dead dude eyes sort of things, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, who it is that does it, how it is that we do it. And actually, in what way the questions that we ask are then framed, because that becomes absolutely critical. Because there is an absolute erasure of these issues across the board. Thank you. Might want to say a few things where I could continue the table. Yeah, the well, I, I might forget. I, I'll start there because I, I just, it's right in my mind. Yeah, no, I, thank you. That's very useful. I mean, um, I don't mean to imply that people working on nationality are only people sort of doing um, non ideal theory. I mean, of course, the global justice, but other, you know, other groups, but I do still feel, I, I think there is, a, there is a move away from doing sort of pure analytic theory that is just about ideal theory, and I think that's positive, and especially I see it in the global justice literature and in the healthcare literature as well, where you've got a lot of people looking at what would a just health system look like that isn't just a kind of ideal theory question. I do think, however, that the practical questions that people see as the 
non-ideal bits that they can uh, use as sort of, uh, I don't know, for help them thinking through their ideal theory tends not to look at experiences they don't have. And so that's why there's more focus on nationality, because I think even the sort of most nationalist philosopher, it, one, on reflecting, realizes there's something quite curious about sort of the state of nation states and the way in which we draw membership and the moral sort of obligations that then flow. So you have to be very, very, you know, un, you know, not very interested about the world to, to not to look at that question. And even Rawls did, you know, this sort of nations uh, uh, debate. But I think I would argue as well that um, in terms of the curriculum ethics, I mean, I think an introductory introduction to ethics course needs much more, you know, prominently to look at questions of real world injustices and how philosophers have and are currently responding to it, not just a sort of uh, either a historical survey or, you know, I, th I think there's a lot more that can be done in that space. Um, I also agree, I mean, I don't, it is, I think it's a fair characterization that I'm using the tools of, of analytical philosophy to make my case. Um, and that was, you know, um, yeah, that, that's that's true, but I definitely do not think uh, that that's the only way to go about this practice, and I absolutely would endorse more critical uh, race philosophy, and I do uh, worry about the sort of dominance of, of the analytical liberal tradition, though I also worry that we don't use enough of the resources of that tradition to, to be self-critical, because I think there are a lot of resources. I'll, stop, I'll just mention the last uh, uh, point, Sharar's Sh point around self-respect and respect of others, because I think that's... I do discuss this, but I don't have enough time really, again, to go into it, but in my view, equality of opportunity is quite a slippery concept. I mean, it, it becomes, um, even Honor O'Neill, actually, in the 1970s, wrote an article about um, affirmative action for women. I don't know if she mentioned it, but she, she d defended affirmative action for women in a 1975 article on grounds of equality of opportunity. Um, and, you know, I don't think it's obvious that you can have uh, a sort of tight equality of opportunity, so tight a quality of opportunity that you don't look at the outcomes in the real world. Because those are the barriers to opportunity that are relevant, and those are the, the ones that we need to dismantle. Um, in terms of, I, I'm glad that you, well, I'm glad. I think it's right to say that there's a concern about how far others will feel that my securing of a post uh, diminishes my capability or my skills or my talent. Um, because there's another argument that I find really well, where people sort of complain on the behalf of other people's self-respect, I would feel particularly low if I knew I got a job in such and such a way. Whereas the studies of uh, beneficiaries of affirmative action have suggested that none of them have debased self-respect. They get into jobs and realize that other people have got there not through equality of opportunity, but through other benefits. And so most of them have a fairly high level of self-regard. And however touching you know, the concern of uh, white people for my own self-respect, I, I think I can <laughs> let, let me worry about that. And, you know, let, let, um, uh, let, I don't know if that was the best thing to have said, but anyway. So, um, but I, no, I do think it is a real issue. And over time, I, I've got more to say, but I think we should let the conversation continue. Thank you. Um, Jackie. Um, Nina, um, quick. Um, my name is Jack I'm a recently elected councillor in Lambert, and so I'm kind of like looking at it from the outcomes perspective, which you kind of like mentioned. And um, as a recent chair, for example, of a residents association, a monitoring board in a massive regeneration area, what the experience was was um, a private finance initiative kind of corporate big company coming in doing the regeneration but the harm to the, to the communities which are predominantly um, uh, black women raising their children um, has just been really 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 quite shocking and then when that those harms are reported back to the local authority um, they just kind of want to sweep it under the carpet. So some of these harsh realities of the experience at that front line, line level, and actually that was the catalyst, that experience over a two year period was the catalyst for me to say, hold on, what's my local council is doing to help us? Because when we ask for help, nobody doesn't want to hear the residents' voices, the residents' experiences. 
So what I'm asking then is what support can this kind of a space or this kind of a thinking give to those people who on a practical level are trying to negotiate in the best interest of, of their communities to address those harms, those discriminations, the impact of, of, of racism? Um, I have a, very quick, a couple of comments on your paper. I mean, Channel to say that, and then practical prefakes for our group, our group. Our group. Uh, on the paper, uh, Omar, I think uh, there is actually not enough being said about the benefit to the individuals from affirmative action. We take them as digits, and, and there are no stories. We really do not know. And I, I can say that when you actually talk to people, the recent experience of going to a premier institute of law in India, now, sir, and speaking to the five, six Dalit students who got there through affirmative action and their individual stories and the leaps they have made in the course of one or two years of where they came and where they are today and what they intend to do after they leave the institution, they're extraordinary. Not, you know, we know about a they're getting a scholarship from a Corona thing and then going off and, you know, that's, that is what it does. And I think we, what the worry is that the other side, I always call other side, the other side always thinks this is wasted. There's so one part of their claim against affirmative action is that they are being deprived. So that's the argument about injustice, etc. We can go, you know, that's a separate kind of argument. But they also think that helping somebody who they think does, does not deserve, you're wasting a resort. And that is a lie. I think so it's important actually to focus on the, 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 what individuals do and how they benefit. And I think they'll be great if somebody does a project or people do projects where you collect stories and about these people and write about what, what it has done for them. What I'm I, I only talking really not in the context of America or what I know nothing of, but you know, really in the context and similar. So that's that's one. The two, the worry about merit. I think in this country already, I've had this question asked many times from students who don't really know how equal opportunities work, that even though there is a affirmative action, I'm always, it's assumed that I came in because of affirmative action. Sure, so you're already there, aren't we? <laughs> Why not? You know, that's, the, that's the assumption already in people's minds. So why make it real? Why can't we make it real? So <laughs> and, and you're living with the that. Practical questions, the practical question uh, about our city currently for philosophy. One is that this country recognizes, and there's nationally so many, so many uh, reports on this, that black and minority ethnic students' attainment is systematically low compared to white students. This is a problem. All white chancellors of all universities are racking their brains about what to do about it. But the link is not made with curriculum, and it needs to be made with curriculum. That part of the danger, the problem is that people are not associated with what's being taught to them. So there are opportunities to then think, link these two things together and really put some pressure on the curriculum is a part of the problem. And you know, we, we could do something about that. Three, connected with curriculum. QA is right now, uh, is re reviewing it the subject benchmark for philosophy. Right now it's happening. It happened uh, after seven years or something, and it's happening right now. The subject heads have been asked, people are being asked to comment. I'll be more than happy if people want to send, look, read the QA subject benchmark statement for philosophy. Look at it and see how room can be made in that statement for critical philosophy of race to count as philosophy. It's particularly relevant, I think, for smaller departments who have to select what part of the curriculum they can teach. They can't teach the whole lot, and it's accept accepted that in joint programs they'll be making selections. So we have to write a statement or put some words in the subject benchmark statement which will make it possible for those departments who select philosophy of race, etc., as a part of the curriculum to pass the subject benchmark. So the subject benchmark has got to be more to widen so that then you can use it. Okay, so that's my practical suggestion. I'm happy to get received any emails or anything, any suggestions that people have. And my final thing, uh, practical suggestion is that a lot of, um, uh, again, departments are under pressure that they have to get external funding for research and so on. Now here we have a group of people, a number of people who we know are thinking alike on many issues. So it's really an ideal opportunity for people to form some kind of consortiums or think about you know, groups of people who could work together and maybe we can have a drop box where everybody sends ideas 
there are millions of call, bids that come in, calls for external funding that come in, and people have to willingly come together with people who they really don't agree with. Now here are the people you agree with. So we should really be thinking of a research project, externally funding research project, which we do between ourselves. So those are my suggestions. Thank you, Nina. Kweku, um, um, uh, uh, Sham, Robin, and uh, Gabby. Oh, sorry, uh, you are as well. Uh, I'm going to try and take as many. Yeah, yeah. Quick. Right. Well, you you said, where do we go from here? I'm not an academic, I'm not a philosopher, but I'm glad um, these disciplines are, are being used to look at the race. I'm saying, what are you talking about? What are we talking about? In terms of descriptors, labels, armor, um, you talked about black and Asian. And the introduction I hear, you got some to the census. I guess that must be the o o -C, o ONS. The ONS has been very, uh, what should I say, not very receptive to listening to other points of view about how we want to be described. Yesterday there was a discussion here about African, not black. I'm quite comfortable for organization that's a bit political like OBV to talk about black. Because it's what OBV, Operation Black Belt, is quite inclusive in terms of marginalized or, or victimized or, or organizations. But you have to think tank on race. And if your definition is talking about black and African, I'm slightly offended because what does the black mean? Why are you comfortable with Asian? And how do we come from being described as black in our Asian text, and up to the 19th century, we were pretty much, pretty much described as black, and now in the 1970s, we were black, and then in the 80s or so, we became black and Asian. And why are you validate that, that Asians should be a separate entity, and we're all known to, as, as black? I'm quite uh, slightly or offended. I think as an African, and there's a group of Africans who feel we should be described as African, that should come in the debate, and that should be in, 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 in the way you us. Yeah, I think that, that's the point I, I, I want to make. So I'm just interested, what was your interaction in terms of the census? Because if you're using black and uh, Asian, then we haven't moved further. So if you just a little bit about your interaction with the census, so that's mentioned in the introduction. And that's randomly a race think tank where does uh, uh, the definition can be used more than just black and Asian. Maybe you can say this was a short presentation, that's why you just make a shorthand. But I think the dialogue of having African in there needs to be addressed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to allow us to run over until quarter past at the very latest uh, so that we can get as many people in. But I, I won't. Is that okay, Shiva? I'm not going to say anything against okay. that. <laughs> okay, if they come and kick us out, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll, I think 10 past then. Um, so, um, <laughs> Sham? Uh, Sham? Um, well, one concern. Please keep, uh, please keep your contribution short. Yeah. So one concern that I might have is that it seems like the dialogue seems between bad white people and the poor black people in the history. So I would like this critical philosophy of race to include much more a, a wider kind of theoretical thought that has been going on in all continents throughout all history. And I would like to echo the academic thing that does shouldn't just be one module that a student like me might take. Rather, uh, like a curriculum that you know, like all people should, especially in history, maybe, kind of be engaged in as young people grow up, and not just young people, but anybody. Yeah. Shami uh, took my class in uh, the critical philosophy of race last term, which is the first class ever to be uh, labelled as the philosophy of race in this country. Um, Robin. Um, yeah, so I just have a sort of suggestion, uh, which is also a question, and it's about thinking about how to transform philosophy within uh, wider trends in higher education, especially at this moment, and how there actually might be um, more positive possibilities here. So uh, I don't know how far the parallels carry, but in the U.S., I mean, higher education, the academy is in a crisis. Humanities are in a crisis. The you know universities are being corporatized. Um, tenure is under attack. It's becoming increasingly uh, contingent labor, publishing is totally uh, changing because of digital technologies and open access and so like books and things like that are totally changing. Our demographics are totally changing so um, within decades we will be majority non-white 
And all of these, I mean, uh, you know, lead to a lot of hand wringing and sort of um, distress because they, in some ways, are troubling trends. But they also represent opportunities for us because um, things are changing, and that means we can change them in the directions that we want to. Um, and I think there are actually ways in which uh, this is a really good moment of opportunity because. For example, um, there's much higher demand for you know Chinese philosophy or Indian philosophy than there are maybe you know philosophy of mind or metaphysics or something like that. And so these are these are ways in which there are ways in which um, what we're trying to do is in line with the times uh, in a way that it may not have been in the past. So it's a, it's a talk. Just a very quick practical suggestion um, that connects to the question of curriculum. If we could, as people who work in this field or are interested in working in this field, have um, I don't know, like a, an online database or something where we could begin to build a bibliography of critical philosophy of race such that we all have access um, to the kinds of reading because oftentimes people are interested in pursuing a subject but they're left dealing with the master's tool simply because they don't know how to access or what other tools are available. So I think that would be something quite simple that we could just drop book titles in or journal articles or, <coughs> as a database that we build as a community of scholars and other interested people. Uh, this film title abused my power as the chair, just to so, say that my original intention had been for us to c continue communicating via the emailing list philosophy-race at ucl.ac.uk. Uh, that, I think, may well be a good idea, uh, but Nina has suggested, as Agami has seconded, a Dropbox where we um, share uh, things like uh, document uh, documents that are <laughs> curricular and the like. Um, but Zara uh, suggested to me yesterday that it might actually be better if we share our feedback, not via an emailing list, or uh, uh, share our curriculum, not via um, Dropbox, both of which are private communities, but that we share both feedback and curriculum in a public way. Um, perhaps on a blog. I'm not actually yeah. a, a blogger, no, but maybe someone who is. Yeah, um, yeah. And if this is something that we would like, yeah. this is a way in which we could um, express to the world, or at least to Britain, uh, what we think about this conference, what we uh, think about the critical philosophy of race here in Britain, and um, our ideas for taking it forward. Um, uh, a public job box would be a good idea because then anyone can reach that information. Yeah, can I just say as a non-philosopher that yeah. would be really, really helpful mm -hmm. uh, because that could point other people yeah, in my yeah, field towards that. Right. Right. Yes, yeah, yeah, books, articles, whatever resources, mm -hmm. artifacts, artwork, whatever that you can point such that we can share and begin to build that canon because we mm -hmm. talked a lot yesterday about the canon and, and the question always comes up, well, who's going to be included if you don't have an answer to that question? you know, and, and concrete resources that you can draw on, it just becomes a theoretical discussion which mm. I don't think any of us want in, in that respect. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Really sorry. Blog, like, I kind of accidentally set up a blog to do with in academia, which is really nice in an email. Um, actually, it was really an accident. Uh, it's very surprising. There's something about blogs where it facilitates further conversation as well. So it, yeah. it provides a space not just for static resources. Yeah. We can have everybody kind of, you know, we can have discussions, uh, you know, yeah, you can have like conversations that you write up between each other that happen over email that get stuck online. So it's yes. one of these things that this, we can figure out. Yes. <laughs> and uh, what, what was the order? I guess um, um, we're going to you next, and then uh, Kevin, uh, Michael, uh, oh sorry, Kevin, and then David, and then Michael. Yeah, hi, Koda, I'm Bert there. One thing that's come through this conference, especially through the papers today, is the need to, um, I guess, locate these ideas of theorizing around race within a particular um, history, within a particular legacy. That's what you know, Nathaniel was talking about in your paper as well, talking about affirmative action. You know, that betrays an idea that there is a history which requires correcting. And that's what, for me, is quite interesting to think about race, especially in this nation state, and particularly Britain. It's, you know, it's, it's not so much the discrimination of you know, people on their appearance, which, you know, all by us on people find, you know, distasteful, but it's very much the position that ideas about race play in the both material and intellectual formation of this current world order, which for me, I find, um, that's what needs unpacking. I grew up in Liverpool, and, you know, I thought I grew up in a city. It was only later that I realised, you know, as an Italian people like Glasgow, it was more like a living, you know, monuments to the wealth of slave traders, like from the library building to all these other kind of places, and that's on a material level. And 
similar with the intellectual, you know, we've mentioned about the ideas of John Locke, the ideas of Adam Smith, the ideas of Immanuel Kant. A lot of, you know, these ideas of equality are built upon this particular history. And uh, I was wondering, if Nathaniel, could say a little bit more about, um, you were talking about a meeting in relation to reparations that have been raised. You know, last year, the 12 Caricom countries spoke about putting in the clay for reparations, and the response to that was, it was fascinating to show such a trigger point because, you know, while one of the key ideas of this kind of liberal democratic state is the idea of inheritance of property, the idea of inheritance of sin, you know, give, I don't want the sins of my father, but I will have the wealth of the father. So that's pretty much the argument of a lot of those people. And for me, uh, uh, yeah, I, I just I would like to hear a little bit more about that and what effect you think that might have. Because obviously you can't quantify the damage of that particular history, but it may betray the the position that history has in, like I say, the formation of the world. I'm going to have to ask people to uh, make a, a very short comments. I'm so sorry. This is a conversation that we really need to have and to, to keep having, but uh, I can't <coughs> promise that we have this room longer than uh, uh, we scheduled it for. Um, I, I will be very brief. Uh, I, I, would just, I would like to raise a question about the work done by the word critical in critical philosophy of race. Do you mean to differentiate critical philosophy of race from philosophy of race? And if so, what is excluded by that qualifier? So I'm involved in that debate with Jasper on Twitter, on Twitter. And I made the point that you, I, I would believe this. You guys, he said the dog, you're near Ivy Towers, philosophers. And he said, I said, these guys, you guys, are, are creating ammunition for them to fight at the forefront. So I'm going to give you a bit of a challenge. There's a debate now about the Rooney Law. Do you know the Rooney Law in, in football? Okay, look, yeah. look, look, look back there. There's a disproportionate number of black players to managers. It's, it's, it's extraordinary. You know, the, the Premier League, the Championship. And the, the, there's a debate whether you should take on the Rooney Law, which says you, it's a kind of positive discrimination. It's a positive consideration. You, you, if you're going to have a, a manager of a football uh, team in America, at least one of the candidates has to be black. So there's a, de there's a debate. Now, I'm not saying the Rooney Law is a solution. What I'm challenging you to do, that's a, this is a very real, current, and practical problem that you could apply your intellect to, to your debate, and it's, 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 it's focus and say, this is our suggestion. Give some, some, some tools, some ammunition. Thank you, Michael. Dante? Oh, Kevin and Dante. Very briefly. Um, this question about advising and who should do philosophy and where it's done, um, I think that we should look to places like uh, studios in which grand music is produced. There's some interesting ideas about justice and philosophizing about law and justice happening in those kinds of contexts. And I've written about this on, in dance hall. <coughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm imploring the philosophers who are um, worried about their jobs um, and maintaining secure positions in philosophy departments that being critical necessarily means you have to link this philosophizing to other spaces and other types of texts. So that's what I would like to see. Thank you, Kevin. In fact, my thought is that we have come to 10 past two. And these questions, they need answers, and uh, we need to continue the debate, but the answers aren't necessarily going to come from Dr. Khan or myself, although we do need to participate in the debate. What I urge us to do is to continue uh, discussing this and dis uh, deciding how we are going to move forward um, and continue uh, working together to build what essentially will be the critical philosophy of race in the world. I thank you for your participation and uh, I look forward to working with you.